Clinton friends, let us welcome Rabbi David Hartman. in thinking about the role of spirituality during the summertime and I was moved by the fact that this was the theme chosen for myself because I have a sense that there is something happening in America in which people are aware that there's something more to power, to affluence, and that in some sense spirituality is a desire to endow a with a deeper connection to a deeper framework of meaning, to feel that one's life is not just here and representing a temporal moment unconnected to a larger meaning, but people are looking for the holy. We can call it a looking for God. They're looking to anchor their life in some ultimate ground of meaning. Meaninglessness is the killer to the significance of human life. I've spent the majority of my thinking life reflecting on what I as a child saw but yet did not understand in my parents' home, which mediated for me spirituality. Wittgenstein remarked that the limits of your language should revolve around the limits of your experience. I'm not going to speak about spirituality in abstract universalist terms, but spirituality as it was reflected in my own life in the experiences that I saw. I was privileged to be born into a home in which I saw the transformative power of a day in the life of a family that was poor. I recall my father, who was a poor customer peddler, Many times during the week when I would have to ask him, Pa, can I have some money for ice cream or things of that nature, in which often he had to say no because never he didn't have. And always feeling himself a failure economically. And yet when Shabbat came, when the Sabbath came, I saw how the man with the hoe was transformed how poverty did not define his own sense of dignity. I saw how after sunset he changed his clothes and we sat at the table and my mother would always serve him the head of the fish so that he should feel he's the head of the family. And he would sing his Shabbos song. And I as a child had very little patience for all the melodies that he heard from his father who heard it from his father. And the thing I learned that my father's greatest gift to me was his ability to be irrelevant in my life as a child. He had the ability to sing his song, if I understood it or not. And when I'd say, Pa, could you hurry it up a little bit? My girlfriend is waiting. He would say, Duvit, die wir sitzen du, bis ich will finishen alle meinen Gunim. You will be here until I finish all my songs, because that's how my father did it, and that's how I do it. And you're going to have to learn to sit patiently at a meal, quietly without having your rushed teenage agenda. He didn't use that language, but in a sense, 
he used a different language. Now this, the dignity of not being frightened to be irrelevant. That's a profound sense of dignity. The ability to be yourself without measuring yourself by the sense of how young people are going to respond to you. And I asked myself as I began to grow older, what gave this customer peddler this ability to suddenly see himself in totally different spirit, in a different sense, a different sense of identity. How did this poor, impoverished family that often didn't have chali for Shabbos, and we used to be dispossessed sometimes because we couldn't afford to pay the rent, and my father would move us in Brownsville from place to place so he can take us out of the concrete jungle, and we go to the Catskills for the summertime, and then, because then he didn't have to pay rent. How did as Edwin Markham remarked, to what avail do you build worlds if the builder doesn't grow as well? What gave this family and this person the ability to sing, the ability to study, the ability not to define himself purely by the check he would bring home at the end of the week? How did he transform himself from economic man to spiritual man? What gave him that power and what gave my mother the power to keep the family within the tradition? Because I remember when we, the family came from Jerusalem because of poverty in 1929. My father was born in the old city. My mother was born in Tzfat. And when he came here, his brothers told him, Shulam, you should know this is America. If you don't work, you don't eat. And therefore forget about the notion of Shabbat. Forget about all those traditions that you had in the old country. Here, seven days shalt thou labor. And my mother said, Shulam, the soul that we had when we lived in Jerusalem is going to be the soul that we're going to have here. And this is how we're going to bring up the family. And my mother, thank God, had the influence. And if we reflect on what they did, not on what they thought about, on the living tradition that grew in their lives. Let me see if I could in some way share with you, in capsule form, what this spirituality was about. The Sabbath is the mediative principle for spirituality in the Judaic tradition as it comes out of the biblical framework. Six days shalt thou labor, Sheshet yamim ta'avod v'yom ha'shvi shabbat l'adonai elehecha on the seventh day shall be a Sabbath to the Lord your God because in six days I created the world and the seventh day I rested. And the rabbinic tradition interestingly says that six days shalt thou labor that this is also a mitzvah. It's not only a mitzvah or a commandment to observe the Sabbath in terms of secession of labor but what you do during the six days is equally as well part of the spiritual dimension. Spirituality in the rabbinic tradition was not a day of retreat or withdrawal from the world or some way turning inward, but equally as well what you do during the six days defines your spirituality as well. So there's an integrative harmony because from the seventh day to the sixth day. Now what is that dialectic? In the creational story, you have as well a God who shapes the world. The biblical vision of God, in contrast to Aristotle, is active. He's willful. Now, the shaping power, the ground of reality is a personal will, an active will. The creation of the world comes out of the biblical tradition. For the Aristotle, the world was co-eternal with the ultimate principle of motion. The world is a given in the Greek tradition, flowing from necessity, from the divine reality. In the biblical prophetic tradition, creation grows out of a personal will. So willfulness, wanting the world, wanting existence, living in the world is in some way to encounter a personal will. So existence is not just a brute fact of necessity, but there's some implicit purpose. What does this come to teach me? What am I required to do? 
to be in the biblical sense is to live with responsiveness to be is to be awake to a world calling you to act and yet this God who is so powerful and acting ceases his activity on the Sabbath pardon my male gendering in terms of theology it's a result of my earliest yeshiva training and I if I would have to stop speaking that way I just would be silent you know become like a stutterer like Moses so you'll forgive that it's not only that you should forgive me but God should forgive me for calling him in a male gender because I think he would get confused he would get confused <laughs> now there are two ultimate principles two ultimate rhythms that define the spiritual life there's the willful principle the principle of energizing the principle of empowerment the ability to cope and shape reality the sense of adequacy to respond to a world that's many times unresponsive to our needs to feel adequate to cope with weakness to shape the world in our image this is the willful aspect of spirituality to feel energized to act the biblical tradition is deeply opposed to the Eastern tradition which sees in withdrawal into the inner soul into the quiet contemplative framework the essence of spirituality in the biblical framework you find the spiritual life in the activist principle of life in feeling called to shape and create a world a builder to be a builder in the world not to feel helpless resignation before the world this is the energizing willful principle of the God of will not the God of necessity which came out of Aristotle now the willful God equally as well does something that seems so strange which one doesn't understand here God says let there be light and there was light let there be a cosmos and there was a cosmos and then God creates humans in his image and he wants human beings to be mentioned so I imagine God should have said let there be a mensch let there be a mensch and a mensch should have come I mean if you can create a cosmos why can't you create a human being so if you read in the Garden of Eden story I mean suddenly you, you look at Eve and say Eve please no don't think it's gonna give you something and you wonder, many, I'm, I'm, even in Hebrew school, I remember asking, why couldn't God create people nice? What was this principle of humans who have the ability to say no to the divine power? And I would say the second principle of spirituality in terms of the image of God, which is going to be very important in terms of the Sabbath, is that God creates a principle of otherness the human is in the human's freedom in the ability to sin in the ability to say no to the divine power is when the divine reality finds its fullest fulfillment otherness is an important feature of the divine relationship to the world God relates to the world not only in the principle of power as the Lord of the world but the Sabbath introduces the principle in which God withdraws his power as Lord and meets the world as other this is the meaning and God blessed the seventh day and made it holy it stands in its own otherness the human being in the presence of God is God's divine other and it's God's divine challenge to see if I if he could introduce a new principle into reality to live without control to live without power the meaning of Sabbath is in some way to integrate into your consciousness two dimensions of experience in the quest for spirituality in our lives is not a simple thing it is the ability and this is what the Sabbath did for my father it's the ability to build life without control I remember the dialogue I would have with my roses when I would have a garden in Montreal when the synagogue had a synagogue home. The first time a Brownsville boy had a garden and I was overwhelmed as I would walk Friday and the Sabbath would come 
And I'm sure you've noticed in a Jewish calendar, and you notice when the Sabbath begins, it says 412, 418, then it goes to 430, quarter to five. And I remember having a dialogue with someone who says, what's all this confusion all these times when Sabbath begins? Why don't you make a fixed time so people would know six o'clock? And I remember having a dialogue with one rabbi. He says, Sabbath in my home begins when I say, let us proclaim the Sabbath. I say, sorry, I, you're so fortunate, Rabbi Miller. In my home, it's a race with the sunset. Is Shabbos ready? Wait, it's not yet. It's many times I feel like saying to the sunset, listen, I'm working on my last chapter of my book. Can you please wait? Joshua was able to do it. I can. And in a sense, it doesn't wait for me to be ready. I have no control when the Sabbath comes. It comes with sunset. In the rhythms of nature, suddenly the world takes on another dimension. There's a new ontological reality. It's a world that proclaims human life without power and manipulation. Suddenly you discover a way of dignity without control. Without control. Without, in other words, to be empowered is not just the ability to shape. To be empowered is equally as well the ability to love. The ability to see the other. My father, when it came Shabbat, would sit at the table and the family would sing or talk. There was no television, thank God. So we spoke. It was like speaking about a different world. And children spoke to parents. Wives and husbands had to learn the art of communicating, of meeting each other without manipulation. There was no control. Sabbath is the principle of harmony. It's the principle of relationship without manipulation and power. And in a sense, these two dimensions of spirituality, the empowerment dimension, the shaping, what form do you give the shape? How do you live with these two opposing ry rhythms? I would say we don't integrate them in a perfect harmony, but we allow them to be. Sometimes it's important to allow different rhythms to be in your soul. How that gets integrated ultimately into your psyche, it's n you don't control that. Just allow them to be there. The ability to, in one level, have an aggressive instinct towards life, not be passive, be willful, and in another aspect, to live without power so that your servant may rest like you. Sabbath introduces into the family otherness. The ability for each person to meet each other in their separateness and to believe in the capacity for relationship without control. Because many times the terror of being alone, the terror of loneliness, and many times we create dependency through money or through other things because we're terrified that the person won't respond if we can't elicit that response. What will happen when children will be in some way capable of standing on their own feet? I remember I used to work with mothers in my community who were constantly worrying about the children's homework in school. And I pleaded to let him try to see if he could make it on her own. <laughs> and I remember it was a trauma for her. It was a truthly trauma. Okay. The trauma was what if the child discovers that she could cope with reality without my help? Would she then even want to turn to me? In a sense then, the need for control is not because we want to sadistically. It's because we want relationship. We want to be loved. We want to be cared for. We want to be needed. And we think that without power, no one would come. The ability to believe that the world could be responsive and humans could be responsive to you without power is the great gift of the spirituality of the Sabbath. And I would say, and just quickly, because I want to keep within the range of my time, in the modern world, Israel, and you people are so devoted, Israel has given spirituality to the Jewish people by empowering the people not to leave history. 
after the demonic experience of the Holocaust, the normal response to human life should have been to go into the coffee houses of history and hide and become Stoics. Learn not to care. Learn not to care. Learn not to be involved because you never know when demonic evil will come. And in a sense, Israel, when I live there in Jerusalem, what I feel is the power of a people who refused to leave history, who refused to abandon the possibility of tikkun ha'olam, of shaping the world, not allowing the memory of the Holocaust to paralyze our will. It is the six days shalt thou labor is a mitzvah. The holy is found in the activist principle, in the belief in possibilities, in belief that tomorrow could be different than yesterday, in the belief that I can shape my world, that I'm not a passive victim. Israel has in some way healed the Jewish people from becoming passive victims. It has energized our will to become responsible for a total society. And in that sense, this giving, this will, is why I deeply respect the efforts of my Prime Minister and Secretary of State in the peace process. I'm deeply shocked when I hear that rabbis are opposed to this peace process. <laughs> deeply shocked. And I would say to you, what is the spiritual meaning of the peace process to me? And I remember I speaking to my son. I have 13 grandchildren in Israel. And one is now going to the army. What Rabin and Paris have done, they've introduced a new word into the vocabulary. When I came to live in Israel in 1971, when I would ask, why is this done? The answer I would get, I don't know if you ever had that experience, kacha, kacha, kacha. That's how it is, kacha. This is the way things are here. There's a deep, since Israel is a revolutionary society, in order to survive, it had to become really conservative in its psyche. Kacha. Kacha mekubal etzleinu. That's how it's been by us. And that sense of this is the way it has been, has been the dominant spirit. What Rabin and Paris have done, they've introduced the word maybe. Change may happen. The notion that tomorrow may, maybe, not as a certainty of peace, but to introduce into your political vocabulary the notion of maybe is a deep spiritual and religious act to feel that your life could maybe take on another meaning not a blind sense of hopefulness or romanticism no maybe i'm not caught in the web of necessity it is a jewish country deeply deeply believing that the role of Israel was never to check out and never to despair at the notion of possibility. The belief in possibility is a profound aspect of spirituality. But the further aspect of spirituality is what you do in your homes. On Friday night when you light those candles and cover your eyes, what you're saying is, may a spirit of relationship without manipulation pervade my home. I give up power. Let us meet each other in, in an I thou instead of subject object, but into subjectivity, a way in which your home can breathe that quiet, that silence. So you're energized to act, I know that. Amazing sense of empowerment. But there's another form of empowerment, to believe in the power of relationship without manipulation. To believe in the ability for people to love each other and to care without having to manipulate that relationship. When you light those candles Friday night, that's what you're saying to the home. And I, my bracha to you all is, have the courage to be irrelevant to your children, as my father had to me. Will children understand everything that you stand for in the beginning? No. The purpose of being a parent is to give a memory, a burden that children their whole lifetime have to think about. I mean, a whole. <laughs> and I believe 
What our children require are heavy memories. They're so thin because their world consists of their own peer groups. They need to meet people who represent and bear witness to something else. Bear witness to your own spiritual hunger. Are the kids in there with it? I don't know. Are young people showing up? I don't know. Are they excited by it? I don't know. Don't feel that you have to compete with Madonna all the time. Feel that what you have to compete with is the sense that you want your life to have a meaning and a purpose and you want to bring your family into a larger rhythm of meaning bear that witness as a philosopher I can only say because my father had that courage I spend a lifetime thinking about the dialectic between empowerment and love power and love as two features of reality and to trust both and to live in both rhythms to know when to make room for the other and to listen and to be quiet and to create that quiet. The quiet means in which all people can surface in their dignity, make room for that other. And in that way, I hope you can find spirituality in your own lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susie, for that introduction and for all of your hard work as evidenced by this extraordinary conference. I'm glad to be here with Lois and Richard and Carol and Betty. Your remarks were eloquent and moving. And Rabbi, I have at least three thank yous for you after listening to your remarks. The first is for imbuing my irrelevance to my daughter with spiritual meaning. <laughs> I am, um, I, I am so lucky to have a wonderful daughter, but those of us in this room who either currently have or have ever had teenagers know that despite one's best efforts, you cross that line into irrelevance. Um, and you see it in their eyes, and you see it in their moving back and forth, whether it's Shabbat or it's anything else, where they're saying, this is great, but I've got better things to do. <laughs> Secondly, thank you for expressing, I think, for so many of us, um, what is sometimes difficult to put into words talking about the spiritual dimension of one's own personal life or the need for recognizing the spiritual importance in our collective lives um, is not easy because there are many who have attempted to force spirituality into little tiny boxes, who have attempted to take religion and use it not as a way to welcome people into the fellowship of love, but to draw lines between us and to be able to talk about this, I think, is a very good way to start this conference. It's so important, and especially today, when we do know there is a great hunger for meaning in our lives that goes beyond the material and a great desire amongst many of us to do what we can to create a more spiritual center in the lives of our families and our communities. And it's important to think of it not only in abstract theological terms, but in the everyday. What is it we do every day in the way we treat one another, in the way we respond to requests for help, in the level of patience and kindness we show, in our own efforts to quell the inevitable desire to control, to manipulate. Those are the kinds of daily questions that each of us should be asking and to put it into 
that kind of format is very helpful for me personally. And finally, Rabbi, thank you for saying what you said about the peace process. It is never easy to do what the leadership of your country is attempting to do. But as my husband has said, one of the great challenges we face, not only in the Middle East, but in many other parts of the world, is to have the courage to take risks for peace. And I join you in your words of support for what is being attempted and the importance that it holds, not only for those of us who care about and support Israel, but for the entire human family. I think it is significant that you would start this conference with that kind of message. Because as we think about how to use the resources that we have individually and collectively, when I am, as I always am, impressed by the level of commitment from UJA and from the Lion of Judah and all of you who are part of these ongoing efforts, we often have to stop and ask ourselves, what is the real meaning of what we are attempting to do? What is my contribution to that? Each and every one of you gathered here brings enormous contributions. You bring not only financial, mental, emotional resources, but you bring those spiritual ones as well. And too often in the world today, we find ourselves being divided up as though we could be fragmented into our various roles, into our various concerns. Much of what you are trying to do by reaching out to those who need help, by taking a stand on behalf of the greater effort that unites us, is to search for a kind of integrity in what it means to be a human being and particularly a woman in today's world. The work that you have done is an example of what happens when, as Betty said, women from all walks of life with different experience join together to make their voices heard, and particularly on behalf of those who might not be heard otherwise. I recently saw the same kind of energy and commitment at the UN conference in Beijing. That conference, was intended to focus the world's spotlights on the concerns that confront girls and women every single day throughout the world, and to bring new respect and dignity to the work and the worth of girls and women. And by doing so, to bring new strength and stability to families, communities, countries, and our world. What went on there, I thought, was very important because people came together from more than 180 nations not only to draw attention to issues that matter, but also to share ideas about how we could do things better. That is the kind of work you are doing. When you bring ideas that have worked in other parts of the world back to the United States, or when you take American ideas and transplant them elsewhere, you are helping to fertilize that common ground of common good that needs so much attention and care today. Too often the issues that you work on, the issues that I've worked on for more than 25 years, the issues that I saw being discussed and debated in Beijing are dismissed as soft issues as women's issues, issues that don't really have much to do with the important pressing problems that face us across the globe, issues that don't belong in the boardrooms or in the TV studios or in the corporate offices around the world. But I think that is wrong because these issues, issues that could be broadly summed up, as the rabbi did, and 
how we love and allow ourselves to be loved. Those issues are hard issues. They're the hardest issues we face as individuals, and they are the hardest issues before us in the world today. Every country will rise or fall in the next millennium and the basis of how they care for each other. It matters little if they open new markets or expand trade, if their GDP and GNP and all those other initials go up, if the quality of life amongst the people who live in these places deteriorates. And in today's world, the pressures on all of us derived from complexity and modernism, from the information age and technology, from alienation and that spirit and body killing meaninglessness, those are the ones we have to come to grips with. Every person in the world, whether he or she knew it, had a stake in what was discussed in Beijing. Women comprise more than half of the world's population. In some parts of the world, however, they are falling rapidly as a percentage of the population because they are killed at birth, they are aborted because they are girls, they are denied medical care, they are not fed. And so in some countries, that more than half is below what is expected. Women are 70% of the world's poor and two-thirds of those who are not taught to read and write. Women take care of most of the world's children, run the households, combine not only those responsibilities but also with contributing to the income and economic survival of their families. If women are healthy, educated, literate, safe from violence and able to contribute economically and politically, they will flourish and their families will flourish. And if families flourish, then communities and nations do as well. That is why investing in the lives of women and girls is one of the soundest investments any society can make. We have seen in developing countries and even here in disadvantaged areas of our own, what happens when women are given access to small loans, the kind of projects that are beginning to spring up around the world? They use them as seed money to create livelihoods for themselves and to improve living conditions for their families. When my daughter and I were in Bangladesh earlier this year, we visited some projects run by the Grameen Bank under the leadership of Dr. Mohammed Yunus. We went to a village of untouchables outside a city named Jasor. They were Hindus and no one ever came to their village, but through these small loans over the last four years, women have begun to make income that they're using to buy their children back from servitude where they had been sold so they could help support the family. They're sinking wells for better water. They're buying rickshaws for their husbands so that they can help contribute as well. They're adding milk cows and goats to the family livestock. When it was known in the area that I would be visiting this village, a neighboring village that also was participating in the Grameen Bank efforts asked if I could come there as well and my schedule just couldn't expand to make that possible. So instead, this village said, could our women come and join Mrs. Clinton? That was a remarkable question because that was a Muslim village in a predominantly Muslim country. So when I came to this village, there were Hindu women and Muslim women sitting together, ready to tell me what had happened in their lives since someone had invested a very small amount of money, but a very large amount of hope in their futures. Those kinds of efforts 
are beginning to bear fruit. So what we saw in Beijing was not just another conference and not just a lot of rhetoric. If we follow up in all of the small ways we can individually and in the larger ways that groups like this can do and through businesses and governments make a commitment to girls and women, we will see progress. And that progress will make our world safer, more prosperous, and more democratic. It begins with respecting the human rights of all people and in parts of the world where women are not considered valued. It means respecting their rights as well. It means respecting the decisions women make about their own families and ensuring that those decisions are free from government coercion of any kind. It means giving women the access to health care throughout their life and the access to education. I was very proud of the American delegation that represented our country, headed by our ambassador to the United Nations, Madeleine Albright. It was a distinguished group of 45 men and women, Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, Americans of all walks of life. But to a person, they were united in their commitment to making it possible for us to say and for women to believe everywhere in the world they are valued, they have rights, and they should be given the opportunities to make the most of their God-given potential. It is no accident that this conference, happening as it did, where it did, caused a lot of commotion and controversy. It seems whenever women's issues are discussed, that happens automatically. But despite dire predictions, the conference did lead us to an understanding of what we can do to make the future better. And the issues are not only ones for China or India or Sub-Saharan Africa or South America. They are also issues for us here at home. I have been meeting with groups of working women who are struggling to keep body and soul together who are worried about their children's futures, their education, crime on the street, their access to health care, the kinds of worries that are really at the forefront of any woman or any mother or any person who cares about how she can make sure her family is going to be safe. As we look at what we need to do in our own country, we have many blessings to be grateful for. Clearly, our women and girls have more opportunities than are even dreamed of in many parts of the world. And that's one of the reasons it was so important that American voices were heard. But we also have to understand what women and men in America are up against these days as well. Because even though one has enough food on the table, one has a job, the insecurity that people live with today, some of it directly related to this gnawing sense of meaninglessness in life, makes people vulnerable to all kinds of pulls and pushes that appeal not to their hopes, but to their fears. That's why it's more important than ever that people like us speak out on behalf of a positive vision for the future. Hold out the promise of hope wherever we are, whatever we do. And understand that there are ways in our own lives to build those solid foundations that give people the sense of security that permit them to love and be loved. I hope that this conference whose itinerary looks so inviting to me that I wish I could sit in the audience to hear many of your speakers, inspires each of you to think through what you and I can do better in our own lives, starting in our own homes and then branching out from there. Because the work ahead of us is exciting work. It truly is 
the work of trying to help build the future we all confront. And I am grateful that you have made a commitment, not only on behalf of Jews around the world, but on behalf of what it means to be a human being as we approach a new century. That will be the critical issue. It may not be discussed much in political campaigns. It may be considered a soft or primarily woman's issue. But we know in our hearts that the hard work of building love and hope is the work of salvation for us and our children. Thank you all very much. <laughs>